Um, some of you might not know this, this person. This is Fred Goldstein, a long time member of Workers' World Party, a member of the Secretariat. He hasn't been around a lot recently due to illness. You've read his um, articles in the paper and recent issues, I'm sure. So he's been present. Um, well, this is a s supposed to be on historical materialism. And the illustrative material is twofold. One, an article on the restructuring of the retail industry, which is a sleeper, but it's a big deal. The other one is an article that I wrote. It's not an article. It's a chapter in a book, in this book, Capitalism at a Dead End, called Historical Materialism, Robots and Revolution. And uh, I will try to uh, get into this after a little introduction. I want to say this. Historical materialism is essential to understanding socialism. If you were to go to somebody today and say, we're going to have socialism, they might not be immediately convinced. <laughs> Looking around what they see, the political landscape, the economic situation. And you can't blame them if they haven't got Marxism under their belt. Without historical materialism, the idea of socialism is just that. It's a utopian idea. It's a goal. It's a laudable, wonderful thing. It's moral. But that's not the way we think of socialism. We think of socialism as an inevitable consequence of the development of class society, of capitalism in particular, and that it will be brought about by the working class, the multinational working class. And when I say working class, I mean everybody who has nothing to, ha to sell but their labor power, who owns no property, who owns nothing in the means of production, doesn't own a small business, doesn't own a giant multinational company. Everybody else is pretty much in the working class. There are certain middle class people, but they are not the significant people in society, class in society. The two fundamental classes in society is the working class and its class enemy, the bourgeoisie. And why is the working class fundamental? Because the working class makes everything go, and it can make everything stop. Or, as in the case of many general strikes, it can make some things stop and other things not, by like keeping a hospital open, but keeping a company shut down. But most of all, in the end, the working class is fundamental because it can arm itself. <laughs> it can get arms from the military if they are pushed into war or find other ways. They can get organized. They can organize to topple the capitalist state. This is what makes them the working class and what makes them fundamental. And what Marx discovered was that they played the key role in capitalist society. And when capitalist society begins to unravel, it's the proletariat that can step up and push them out. If it's organized, it doesn't happen spontaneously. You need a revolutionary party of the type that Lenin made in 1902 and 1903. And this is not just a pipe dream. You have the Bolshevik Revolution, which is a classical illustration of how the working class, with proper leadership, can overthrow the capitalists, can destroy the capitalist state, can set up armed workers, 
to defend the worker state, the socialist country, can nationalize industry, can plan the economy, all with the working class at the core of it. Now, of course, the USSR was toppled. And that's a whole discussion for another class. Not today, please. But it doesn't invalidate socialism, not even one iota. And we, that's, a, that's part of the next time we talk about this. But what we see is we see the socialist struggle, the struggle for socialism in China, in Cuba, in Korea, in Cambodia, in Vietnam. And we see these countries struggling because they are all in countries that were not materially ready for socialist develop, full socialist development. Why? Because they were slaves of colonialism and imperialism. But they had to make the socialist revolution to keep from continuing that slavery, to end it. So they had to make the socialist revolution even though they didn't have the material prerequisites to build a full socialist society. And they had to do it in a world that is dominated by imperialism, which is a gigantic material, military, economic, political force in the world. And these countries have to struggle to survive. But as long as we're talking about historical materialism, I think that we're justified in saying that where we are at now in 2017 and have been for the last several decades is in a transition from capitalism to socialism. The first stage of socialism was in the 20th century. And it happened under the most unfavorable possible conditions where capitalism broke at what Lenin called the weakest link in the chain. But that was the first stage. This is the 21st century. And the new stage is germinating right now. And one of the things that's pushing it along from underneath is high, tech te high technology. Because high technology is working on making the proletariat, conditioning it. And by that I mean the community, the students, everybody. Everybody. When I say the proletariat, it's short for everybody <laughs> underneath, on the bottom of society on the lower echelons, as opposed to the bosses in the upper echelons. It's conditioning the workers slowly but surely through it, the impoverishment, the unemployment, the underemployment, the low wages, which march on relentlessly, not just in the United States, in France, in Germany, in Portugal, in Greece, in Spain, in all the imperialist countries. And that process is irreversible. Now, we look around and we see the workers, not just in the United States, but also in Europe, despite their social democratic and socialist past, and it, I emphasize past. Now, and we look around and we see the political establishment, the moderates, have nothing to offer the workers. The Democratic Party leadership here, the Social Democrats in Europe, they have nothing to offer the workers. And that's why you see Le Pen in France, you see Trump in the United States, you see the alt-right in Germany, the Golden Dawn in Greece, and in Eastern Europe too, and Modar in India, the right-wing 
Hindu party. Those, that's the political fruit of the generalized capitalist crisis, which is affecting the workers down below. But it, it's a tenet of Marxism that consciousness determines being. I mean, being determines consciousness. I'm sorry, Carl. I'm sorry, Carl. <laughs> but it, there's a leg. There can be a big leg between the time that consciousness catches up the conditions. It can take a long time, but it always does. It always does. And the kind of atrocious conditions that are deteriorating for the proletariat, will, consciousness will eventually catch up with it. And when the consciousness catches up with the conditions, then the workers will be ready for our revolutionary message. They will be, that's for sure. And when they get to that stage, <laughs> uh, capitalism is doomed, frankly. I just want to see if there's anything else I want to say. Well, yes. I want to make a few remarks which pertain to historical materialism. The premise of historical materialism is that all societies grow up with a certain level of the productive forces. And that's what determines the social and political character. I'll give you one example, and then I'll skip to another one. Primary human society of hunting and gathering, and before that, and after that, even basic agriculture, by that I mean garden agriculture, not field agriculture, was it required the whole community to survive. And the relations within those communities, the clan communities, were communist. There was no private property. There was no classes. There were no class divisions. Why? Because of the level of productive forces, that f that they were so poor, so um, undeveloped, that it required the cooperation of every individual for the group to survive. And that's what bred primary communism, which is testified to by any anthropologist who's worth their salt. Lewis Henry Morgan studied the Iroquois Indians in Upper New York State. He was a Civil War officer. And he unraveled this. And Marx and Engels uh, saw what he did and attributed to him historical materialism. He showed the different stages of society leading up to class society. But that's an example of how the level of productive forces dictates social relations. Now I want to jump past slavery, and which was came out of field agriculture, to feudalism. Because this is the classical example that Marx uses, which is relevant to us today under capitalism. He talked a great deal about the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And he used it as an illustration of how property relations and the productive forces get further and further apart, where the productive forces advance and old property relations hang on, and it leads to revolution under feudalism which is a system in which every noble and prince and local uh, lord and, and the kings, by the way, had serfs. They were hereditary aristocracy. 
You were born into your property. You were born into the land. You were born with serfs who will do the work, who would bring you one quarter or one half of their crops, who would go and grind your grain for you before they ground their own. They were s land slaves, what they call, really. They, they were bound to the property. If a lord sold his property, the, sl the serfs stayed there. They couldn't move. They now belong to the new owner. That was feudalism. Now, under feudalism, each lord and noble had their own territory. And in that territory, they collected all the tolls that they put up, toll gates and so on. They collected tolls. They had their own taxes. They had very often their own currency. They had their own little domain. But capitalism started to develop outs inside the bowels of feudalism. And mining started to develop, and metallurgy started to develop, and, and, and soon manufacturing developed. But the capitalist class can't be locked into some lord's little land and pay his toll and use his currency and then use somebody else's currency and, you know, and then pay another toll a thousand miles later. Capitalism can't develop that way. Capitalism means need big markets. Capitalism mean, needs a uniform currency. They need a way of doing business wherever they go without being harassed and harangued by every local lord for a, a, a hundred miles or whatever it is. So that Feudal relationships was keeping capitalism in a box. They were strangling it. And they had to get out of the box. And they had three big revolutions. The Dutch Revolution, the English Revolution, and finally the Great French Revolution, which swept them away, uh, the lords, by chopping a lot of heads and by expropriating and turning over the land to the peasants and so on. And so that the bourgeoisie could function. They could, they could operate now in a, bigger, in a bigger terrain and conduct business. Okay. Fast forward to advanced, developed, decadent capitalism. Now, what do we see? The bourgeoisie has socialized the world working class. <laughs> they socialized them in this sense. Tens and hundreds of millions of workers get up every day and fit themselves into a world capitalist economy that is in shape by the bourgeoisie. And they all objectively cooperate to produce whatever it is, the book, the mic, a building. That's the product of the world working class. There's no such thing as this belongs to such and such a person or such and such a group or such and such a segment of the working class. Everything that is produced in the world today is the result of socialized labor. The problem is that the property that they use to create this product is privately owned. It's owned by millionaires and billionaires, mostly billionaires. So when 20 or 30 people sit down at the board of directors of General Electric, and they decide what their product mix is going to be, and what markets they're going to aim at, and what facilities they're going to open up or close down based upon their profits which the accountants bring to them. They have the fate of, in this case, 330,000 workers at their disposal who are collectively producing all of this wealth. And these parasites 
are sitting in the boardroom deciding what they do or don't do or whether they work or they don't work or where they're going to work or what the conditions are going to be under which they work. Unless in the United States they have a strong union, but for the, they're a global company. This is the fundamental contradiction of our period. Private property of the means of production and socialized labor process. What? You said private, you private ownership. What did I say? Private property. Oh, I'm sorry. Private ownership, which is about the same as private property. <laughs> but it's private ownership, I'm sorry. That's right. This whole vast network of production global, from China, it reaches from China to Indonesia to Africa to Venezuela, by the way, and, and, and to Argentina, to Chile. It's all owned by a handful of people in the world. And they use it the way you would get up in the morning and figure out where to drive your car tomorrow, this morning. They think about their profits. That's how, that what dictates what they do. So that is the premise of historical materialism, that the, the property relations, private property of the means of production, has come excruciatingly into conflict with the socialized global labor process. And it has to be broken. It will be broken. Because at some point, society can't go on any further. And when it gets to that point, as Marx said, the whole thing gets thrown up, sprung up into the air. <laughs> and the period of social revolution and transformation begins. So that's what we're about. And that's why understanding historical materialism is a, a way to point to socialism because you see the socialization of labor in front of your eyes. You see the problems, the contradictions that are being made worse and worse by high tech. And you can talk to people about this. You can discuss it and explain it in a way that they can understand. Okay, that's it. The struggle by big industry to increase profits drove automation and offshoring. In the retail industry, the giant monopoly Amazon has developed online shopping, which has already wiped out tens of thousands of retail jobs and is threatening hundreds of thousands more. Online shopping has brought about a transformation in the so-called brick and motor retail industry. This transformation is hollowing up suburban shopping malls, bankrupting longtime brands and leading to staggering job losses, wrote the New York Times on April 15th. More workers in general, merchandise stores, have been laid off since October. About eight, eight, 89,000 Americans. That is more than all of the people employed in the United States coal industry. Oh, now jump forward to page nine. And at the bottom of the second paragraph, Read uh, about one out of every 10. About one out of every 10 Americans works in retail. Okay, that's, that's cool. 15 million workers. Yeah. <clears throat> Some of you know, but I'm a, a driver, a black car, limousine driver, and uh, driverless cars are coming, right? We're going to talk about you soon. Right, exactly. So hopefully I'll, I'll squeeze out a few more years uh, uh, before I can retire, like that's going to happen. But um, yeah, it's kind of scary, you know, and, and it's going to happen. So it's right here. And I, I remember recently reading articles that said, you know, in 20 years, you know, 60% of the jobs that we know exist today that have titles and descriptions, all gone. Now, of course, there's going to be new jobs, right? But not nearly as many as they, as automation uh, destroys, particularly, 
you know, computers and robots. So um, it, it's a brave new world we're going to be looking at. I just also wanted to point out the fact that while these retailer, like retail workers are being laid off, that it's not just that they're being put out of a job, but the people who are keeping their jobs are expected to do more different kinds of work. So my roommate actually went into a T-Mobile store the other day, and the employees were actually openly complaining on the job to the customers about the fact that they have to do everything. They are the face of T-Mobile now. Someone brings in their phone, they're expected to back up the phone, they're expected to install whatever new software needs to be installed, they're expected to put on the phone case, the protective cover on the glass, uh, and basically not just do, like, take your money and, and hit the register thing, but they're also sales, technical uh, assistance, uh, tech support, like all of these different sorts of jobs that are being expected of people who are keeping their, their roles in retail for still, like, criminally low wages. Sure. Um, so not just the fact that people are losing their jobs, but the people who are keeping their jobs are expected to do like more and different kinds of work. Like I used to work for a union. You'd say like that's not the job that you're supposed to be doing, but they're loading you up on it, so. Yeah, to speak more on that, I used to work at Target. And I think I spoke about this before, but they had a phrase that they would call on, doing more with less. <laughs> so there were, so they framed it as like your reward for being productive is we're going to have you're going to have a smaller team, even more <laughs> tasks to do, and you're expected to be just as productive, if not even more. And then if you were to accomplish that, they'll be like, okay, now you, since you've proven you can do that, now you can do even more with less. <laughs> and don't they, talk yeah. to a union rep. <laughs> yeah, they even have like when you first get hired, like an anti-union video they show you. So that's like, they frame it as like, it's like your reward for like, doing a good job. What, what, did they, what, did they, what did they say about the money? I have an idea. Oh, you want to speak? They would have like a yearly review where you're getting like, even if you got like, they gave you high marks and everything, it's like 50 cents. 50 cents, right? 50 cents, 90 cents. They mean oh, I see the it. authors of this book. That's in uh, for example, they report that in October 2010, Google announced on its official blog that it had modified a fleet of Toyota Priuses to the point that they were fully autom uh, autonomous cars, ones that had driven more than a thousand miles on American roads without any human involvement at all, and more than 140,000 miles with only minor inputs from the person behind the wheel. Uh, to comply with driving laws. Google felt it had to have a person sitting behind the steering wheel at all times. Um, this research was first funded, oh, get this, by the Pentagon's <laughs> Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, which also developed the internet, um, uh, with driverless combat vehicles in mind. Go figure. The technology was turned over to big business. Uh, how far the bosses can take this technology on roads remains to be seen. And uh, we're all going to see it. But in the background is the uh, long-term potential threat to anyone who drives a truck or a car for a living. Of course, the authors did not consider any fight back on the part of the workers uh, should such technology come online. Just to point out that, uh, you know, Retail jobs aren't, are non-productive, and so they're kind of extraneous and can come and go as, as the rest of the system sees fit for them. But logistical jobs like truck driving and car driving have never before been non-productive. You know, they've always been necessary to move goods around. So by having autonomous vehicles and autonomous transportation, it transforms a whole um, sector that was once actually a productive sector into something that's, that you don't need people for anymore. So there's going to be a lot more people than... Um, productive sectors or needed non-ones like retail. By the way, to, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, uh, retail people are dispensable only because there's a substitute for them. That, it, In other words, it's not like the retail process is gone. On the contrary, it may be even wider than it was. But it's because of the internet. Uh, 
I mean, I, won't, I wouldn't say this is the only reason why cars were created, but as an outcome of cars being created, public transport was scaled back across the country, right? Now, all of a sudden, we have Uber everywhere, which is basically like the cars stepping in and becoming that public transportation again. And then to further that, you would actually take the drivers, like Uber has now tried to be doing driverless cars, which is, you know, but, um, but, but it's like now you're actually even trying to extract like more value from that process by like eliminating labor, even though it's like you didn't have that much labor involved in in train travel as you would with perhaps the trucking industry and I don't have access to those numbers I don't know if it's correct but um, but now you're just sort of like taking that back again like I was I was gonna bring up another example of um, and maybe I'm jumping ahead um, <coughs> IBM had a had a program for all of their employees where their employees could actually telecommute. So that was very common for IBM employees to not go into an office and that they had this huge mobile workforce and that they actually sold a lot of technology that would enable companies to also have like telecommuting workforces. Uh, and so that way people would be working from home all of the time. Uh, I think it was in the last month or so that IBM announced that everyone who was telecommuting who was working from home, and there are some people who've been doing it for decades, uh, I mean, IBM hired, you know, they have 100, 000, more than 100,000 people who work for them, that all of those people would now be forced to go back into the office or else lose their jobs. And that that was sort of like an under... Uh, an underhanded kind of layoff to basically say like well now that you've sort of set up over there now we actually need to rein this back in like we're not going to be depending on this like high tech technology anymore and so we need to bring you back into the office in order to for you to keep your job and it ends up being a layoff it ends up with them having moved ahead in other ways to not need so many people in the labor force that they're now backing off from their telecommuting stuff which has developed like other technologies in its own way of being to, to sort of like shed more of the labor force. Now thousands of them are being eliminated altogether by internet technology and online sales. This is comparable to when auto workers jobs were destroyed by robotization or steel workers jobs were destroyed by mini mills and electronic mills and coal miners jobs were destroyed by giant mining machines. The difference is that this automation is being instituted by an external employer Amazon. The restructuring in retail is different in form for manufacturing, but the same in essence, as far as working class is concerned. Amazon has reduced the necessary labor time involved in the process of commercial retail sales. As such, it can sell at lower prices and increase convenience for the shopper. Amazon's automation is infamous among the workers as a speed-up device and a job killer. In 2012, Amazon bought the robotics company Kiva Systems for $775 million and made it so Kiva's technology could be used only in Amazon's warehouses. These Kiva robots autom autonomously zoom around the warehouse using a series of barcodes on the floor to guide them, picking items and bringing them back to warehouse workers. These robots save these workers from the immense physical toll of walking as many as 20 miles per shift, sometimes in unbearable heat, but this also means that fewer human workers are needed. Okay, that's good. I think it would be good not to have to walk 20 miles, you know, but it's even worse to have no job. <laughs> so, so, well, I thought what was interesting about this is that the retail restructuring is the result of two types of technology, which seem completely different. One is internet technology, which is online buying through Amazon. And the other one is robot technology, which makes the warehouses semi-automatic. And by the way, since I wrote this, this has developed much further, the, uh, where you see some workers at the, buy, at the, at the end of a, a bunch of aisles standing there and right next to them, think about this, is a robot. Yeah. Handing them shit, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't even talk speed. to the robot. And it dictates you, speed. You don't even have the benefit of social interaction, you know? It's, it's eerie, but this is Bezos, this is yeah. Amazon, inside and outside. Uh, but anyway, okay. Uh, the technology and how the, how much money the technology costs and how they have to keep um, in order to stay in competition with the other 
capitalists, they have to keep advancing and getting greater and better technology and that that ends up leading to the falling rate of profit. Is that true in this instance with robots as well? Well, I think the drive now is, of course, the falling rate of profit for the, f the, for the capitalist who gets in first when there's competition helps the capitalist who has the new technology to get in there and can sell at the old prices and make more profit, super profits. That's what you're talking about, the formula made of profit. In other chapters in this book, we go into the falling rate of profit, actually. Um, and it's worth going into. It's, it's really worth studying. There are other things in here about the general law of capitalist accumulation, which we should study. I think right now it's a little beyond this particular discussion, but it's very important. And the, the problem is that the declining rate of profit is operating for sure. But capitalist technological change is so rapid that nobody knows <laughs> who's got what. All they know is they better get there first. They get, they, everybody is fighting to crowd their rivals out of the market and to beat them. I'll get an example to come back to your issue of driverless cars. The head of Ford just got fired. He was replaced by somebody who worked in another industry whose specialty was high technology. And he was brought in to get the competition going to make sure that they beat out Uber for the driverless car, that Ford beats them out. Yeah. And that that is the way it's going. So that sometimes it's anticipated profits that drives them, you know, more than the immediate decline in profit. It's the anticipated profits that make a clear tick. Right. Uh, John and uh, Taryn and Sarah. John Terrence. Um, so related to the last few points, I wanted to bring up a quote at the end of, uh, it's on page five, at the end of chapter eight in Capitalism at a Dead End. Um, and this is to kind of invoke the question of imperialism and how it relates here. So this book's written in 2012, or published in 2012, and we're in 2017. Uh, the, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it, the paragraph uh, five, uh, in the present era. Uh, I'm just going to read these two paragraphs. In the present era of the scientific technological revolution and imperialist globalization, capitalism has now outgrown the framework of the globe. The vast global markets have become too narrow for the further upward development of capitalism as an economic system. It cannot restore its historic rise by economic means alone. There is no natural market-driven course, nor even a course driven by capitalist state intervention in the economy that can restore the profit system to its historic upward development. It would require the massive destruction of productive forces such as took place during World War II to clear a path for a new cycle of capitalist development. But the likelihood is that that, that will be long before the working, uh, or I'm sorry, let me just read it. But the likelihood is that long before that point, the working class would intervene to stay the hand of the war makers. And yet, here we are in 2017, and you can hear the war drums beating, uh, 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 you know, in multiple directions. Uh, the DPRK, I mean, not necessarily Venezuela, it's more of an uh, economic coup, but, uh, I'm sorry? Syria, Syria uh, Iran, all of these groups, like, I mean, people do talk about World War III, you know, like that, you hear that term very often, even if it's not necessarily maybe an accurate way of talking about things. Um, so I'm just wondering how do we use your analysis of like the high tech era and what is happening under capitalism now to understand maybe our own like US ruling class and why there's been 
uh, this what seems to be uh, um, intense aggression uh, in our imperialist endeavors. Okay, just to make uh, to end on another note, why don't you just read the follow the paragraph under that? This yeah, this perspective of the revolutionary class struggle envisions a time when the workers will cease to be the object of history. They will become the subject of history, will become truly class conscious, and take their fate into their own hands. This is the inevitable final result of the capitalist technological revolution. Okay. In some ways, that's my answer to your question, yeah. but, but yours is very specific. Um, well, I don't have a crystal ball. I certainly don't know what the Pentagon has on its mind. But the scale of World War II was enormous. The enormous amount of the protective forces was destroyed. Bridges, factories, buildings, houses, roads, I mean highways, railroads. All this was had to be rebuilt. And uh, Europe didn't have the money, so the U.S. gave them some, loaned them some money, called the Marshall Plan, to rebuild. And that's what got the capitalist class out of the Depression from 1939. It was not the process of capitalist accumulation, the normal process, that got them out. It never did. See, this is more, we got to talk more about capitalism at that end because this, this is very important. For them to do the kind of damage that would enable them to rebuild enough to stimulate the economy and bring it back to like surging the way it did after World War II. I'm not sure what kind of devastation that would require. But I'll tell you this, rebuilding would be much more rapid, because it's all high tech now. Just the same way that military spending doesn't sustain the capitalist system the way it used to. They used to build, you know, five million tanks. Uh, uh, fleets of submarines, fleets of warships, fleets of bombers, fleets of fighter planes. I mean, I'm not talking about 75 or 100 planes or 150 planes that Boeing is going to sell to Saudi Arabia. I'm talking about thousands of them. And it was done by, you know, people in the shipyards, in the, in the airplane factories banging and, and doing all this and so forth and so on. These new weapons, the, the smart bombs, the laser guided bombs, the, uh, the missile ships with the Aegis missile systems, the guided missiles, um, and even nuclear, that's all high tech work. It doesn't bring masses out in millions into the factories. It doesn't. And that's one of their big problems now. Also politically, which is probably what you're most interested in, is they're in a huge crisis, but war, big war, may not solve that particular problem at this moment. The only, the two big wars they can have is with Russia and with China. Those are the kind of scale of warfare that they would need to even get a bump in the economic situ situation. Now, I'm not sure that the Pentagon is all about making nuclear war with Russia right now. They're hostile to Russia. They're straining at the bit. They send troops to Latvia, to Poland, to Lithuania, to Estonia. They try to take over the Ukraine. They're trying to encircle Russia. They want it to collapse from within. They want Putin to collapse. They want to go back to somebody like, I don't know if everybody knows, the, the guy named Yeltsin who took over after the collapse. 
he became a complete creature of the U.S. When the collapse came, he invited the, the guy from MIT, what is his name, Shit. to come over there and do shock therapy and privatize the socialist industries and hand it over to the oligarchy. That was Yeltsin. And let, and, let, and, Milton Freeman. And, let, and let the U.S. come in and walk in, not just the U.S., the Germans too, walk in and take over the economic situation. But Putin came along and, and tried to lift the situation back up. Not because he's some revolutionary, but because he is a nationalist. He's a nationalist who wants to restore a Russian uh, a territory in, in the former republics. He wants that to be their sphere of influence, uh, and he's also holding on to the Mediterranean base in Syria, and he's fighting them back in the Ukraine. You know, so he tried to turn the situation around, and that's why they hate him. They hate him for that reason, and. Uh, and yet, he's got a lot of nuclear weapons. It doesn't take a whole lot of nuclear weapons, no. by the way, <laughs> to mess up a, a territory. You know, so so he's got them. Yeah. So I'm not sure. All the all the period of the Cold War, they threatened the USSR and threatened them and threatened them and threatened them and threatened them, but they didn't do it because the USSR had retaliatory capabilities. Yeah. That's what the DPRK is all about. They must retain their retaliatory capabilities. Once they get that, they can breathe easier and devote their resources to national development instead of all of this stuff. But uh, the other one, big one, is China. A war with China right now would be like cutting off your nose to spite your face. The bourgeoisie is deep into China. They have huge markets over there. Some of them have bigger markets in China than they have in the United States. So that's a contradiction. That doesn't mean they won't do it. I don't want to say they won't do it because private property is mad. Private property can throw reason overboard. I think Trump is one of them, but he's just a little pipsqueak. <laughs> he's got to have the Pentagon with him if he wanted to do that. And they're going to think a long time before they rubber stamp that. So anyway, they have political problems of a global capability. Uh, because they've bombed so many Muslim countries. Eleven Muslim countries in the last how many years? I don't know, I don't remember. Anyone? Yeah. They have created a resistance of a reactionary nature. The, the ISIS. And they can't shake them. They can't, they can't get them. They, they invaded Mosul. They haven't taken Mosul, by the way. They took Western Mosul. They haven't taken the East. And they haven't taken Raqqa, either. They may. They probably will. They will destroy enough people and enough buildings, enough dwellings, enough hospitals, perhaps, to make Raqqa collapse. That's what they did in Western Mosul. Eastern Mosul is different. It's more populated. It's filled with narrow streets. It's very well suited to urban guerrilla warfare. It's going to be hard for them. But they may get through it. But if they do, the masses of Muslim people who are in these, subjected to these bombings, and to these atrocities, look at Yemen, take Yemen. They give the Saudis carte blanche now, Trump, carte blanche, to go in there and just kill everybody that you, you think is in your way for Saudi Arabia. That's not going to go away. They can't shake that. 
they can't shake it. And they can't make they can't make people bow down the way they used to. They they just don't. But, I mean, they try to, Trump tried to shake a stick at the German imperialists. He wouldn't even shake hands with Angela Merkel. He told them they got to pay up their dues, and they got to give more money to NATO. They got to do this. They got to do that. Yeah, they may do about this much, but they're not going to have Trump, you know, dance to his tune, to the U.S. tune. It's not going to happen. And by the way, this budget of Trump, either the bourgeoisie is going to cut it back all the way, you know, just like chop it into little pieces and and, and, and come out with something that they can live with. Or they're going to throw in the towel and they should get ready for a revolutionary struggle in about a couple of years. I'm serious. These Trump people, they're going to get clobbered. You know, they th I've seen interviews with Trump people. And they say, well, oh no, you, you can't take away my medical care. So the reporter would say to them, do you know that that's Obamacare? <gasps> Obamacare? Well, I won't tell anybody, you know. <laughs> but they don't want to give it up because their lives depend on it. People with diabetes, people with heart disease, people with addiction, People with every kind of disease you can think of, their lives depend on it. And this maniac wants to take it all away. He wants to take a hundred billion dollars from Medicaid. There's like 40, 50,000 people in Kentucky who live off Medicaid, in Ohio, in Arizona. You can count up the states, maybe uh, probably close to 20 that accepted the Medicaid expansion. All those people are going to start dying or getting sick. All the nursing homes depend on Medicaid. Rural hospitals depend on Medicaid. But th this is part of the pro this is this is a, an indirect way of answering John's question see. because they have so many internal contradictions and global contradictions that they can't get out of and going to war isn't going to solve somebody in Appalachia's problem who's got three kids and two of them are addicted to opioids and they have to go to the clinic just to survive. It's not going to help them. Is it, no, the war isn't going to fix that. The war is going to bring, if they have a big war, and I'll get off the phone here, if they have a big war, that means the draft. You, the draft. You cannot win a big war from the air. You can just destroy. You can't win the war. You have to occupy the territory. And that takes the draft if it's a big war. Now, the, Vietnam was a relatively small war. But look what happened in Vietnam. The soldiers started killing their officers, refusing to go into battle. And the whole thing, the wheels came off. And then final thing, they were running to get on the helicopters to get out of Saigon. That was a small war. Have a big war like World War II, where they had 15 million people under arms? I don't think so. Uh, I'll stop. <laughs> the Rumsfeld Doctrine, the Rumsfeld Doctrine was shit was just to use special forces and shock and awe and win wars like that. And that was because he lived through Vietnam and he didn't want to live through the draft again. All right, anyway. uh, even though um, 
technology and, and, and technological production is so advanced and is continuing to advance. Profits aren't uh, necessarily growing at the same rates like they used to. What's happening is that there's more consolidation in less people. So you're getting the billionaires are getting fewer and richer, and then some of them are going to get are going to become multimillionaires, and maybe in a couple of decades they'll be millionaires, right? And, and so we're getting more concentration of wealth at the top. Um, also, they're tr squeezing profits out of all kinds of things that capital 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 didn't squeeze squeeze profits out of when capitalism was really productive. Like they're going after everything, right? Um, the post office, for example, from, from a few years ago, they're going after, and, and one of the ways they squeeze us is fees. The kind of fees we pay for everything now is, young people m might think this is, this is, this is, has been, um, but say in the 1970s, you didn't need fees to take your money out of a bank. It's your money, right? You, now you need your money. You have to pay a fee every time you take a withdrawal. Those are profit. Those are those are fees that the, the capitalists are getting. That's another way they're 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 getting money into their pockets. They're trying to find all kinds of methods, you know, to squeeze um, revenue in order to keep their 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 their, their bottom lines up. But it's not necessarily through um, making more profit. They're making more products. And uh, they're making uh, more products quickly and faster, and they're using less storage to maximize profits that way. But they have the inherent contradiction in that they're reducing um, purchasing power while they're doing this. So there's just all kinds of contradictions. So they're going crazy. And we have to um, catch up to the fight because they're not going to stop going crazy, and they will kill us all if they have to. Uh, well, I was going to ask, because this was brought up in another excerpt on page one that we read about DARPA. Um, because the military budget isn't just about conducting wars, but it is also like this huge like research subsidy, and uh, it, it, it helps kind of fuel innovations um, by offering these uh, huge packages of money to any company that's trying to like innovate. Um, is part of the reason why they're cutting back the health care to like increase the military budget partly because capitalism is so decayed that some of these companies are dependent on like that military budget in order to squeeze out profits? Is that is that how the military functions with the capitalist class at this point? I, I so I used to work overseas in some war zones and I I just wanted to mention the fact that there's a lot of money that goes into like rebuilding and then destroying and then rebuilding and then destroying within like the period of like two or three years. So I worked in Iraq for some time <coughs> and we would be working or, or the UN would be working with communities that had been displaced in Iraq four or five times over the course of their lifetimes. So these are people who had lost their homes like four or five times. And each time that they would be uh, displaced and moved to a different part of the country, uh, there was a lot of money that was being invested in trying to set them up there, whether or not that was like shopping malls, schools, hospitals, roads, bridges, everything like that. Um, and then that would be destroyed like within a period of years. Basically like people would go through these training programs of well this is how you're going to become a, a metal worker and then all of a sudden like their metallurgy shop would be destroyed uh, by ISIS or the US or, or something and then they would have to go through like a whole different kind of training. And I just wanted to go over some of the numbers of what had been like invested by just the UN so not even counting like the US or any of the NATO powers although that also goes through the UN sometimes where it's like 4.63 billion dollars was put into Iraq last year. Um, 2.1 billion has already been put into Yemen. 1.4 billion has been put into South Sudan. And only 411 million so far has been put into Syria. I'm talking about this year. Um, and Syria has been low on like the investment end because of course the government there is holding out because there's a lot of like resistance going on and they haven't completely emptied out like the industries there, but you could see it uh, in places like Aleppo 
where um, the so-called rebels would go in and take these factories apart piece by piece and then just sort of ship them out of the country back to Turkey. So it was like a complete capital like transfer. Um, but like those are, are things like people are going to need, you know, metallurgy training or they're going to need like capacity building workshops or they're going to need new schools or hospitals set up in these places in Syria. Um, but these are all places like where even when, when this sort of like humanitarian aid, and I put it in super big air quotes, goes in, it's like soon sort of wiped away in certain places like Iraq, which has seen war for God knows how many fucking years now. Um, their lives have been like torn apart and everything has been just destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt. Same thing with Libya, same thing with Yemen, same thing with, I mean, it just keeps sort of going across all these 11 uh, Muslim countries that you've been mentioning, not to mention places like Pakistan and Afghanistan. So I'm just wondering if maybe that's sort of like a possibility for uh, imperialism to try, or maybe it's like, it's not you know a possibility, but it's sort of like a defense mechanism of imperialism to try and like destabilize these smaller regions like constantly so that they're just constantly in a state of being destroyed and then having money sort of dumped into it to be rebuilt. I was kind of wondering if that would, would be a possible um, outcome rather than like out, out, out and out war with China and, and Russia if if it's just possible to completely de destabilize like whole regions of the world and then you know because no one really cares much about those Iraqis anymore I guess um, or whether or not they've been displaced like six or seven times over the course of their lives and so I was just wondering if that's like a, a bubble or if that's just like maybe like a like a pressure release valve in your estimation same thing with same thing with Central and South America too. I don't want to leave that out. Or with Africa as well. I mentioned South Sudan, but these are just like the theaters of action that I know of, like numbers off the top of my head. So, well, uh, based on your report, <laughs> I think I think the answer is affirmative in the sense that the bourgeoisie is always looking to make a buck, and there's no place and no uh, crime that they wouldn't commit to make it. And uh, they're fine with that, as long as it brings in money. The problem with the, the overall uh, uh, campaign of aggression, intervention, open war, you know, indirect proxy war with Saudi Arabia, so it, it's too contained to get the capitalist system revived. That, that, that's what we need to understand most of all. And that's pretty much what's in this book, Capitalism at a Dead End. Is that the means that they have historically used to overcome the collapse? And there's been three of them. One in 1873, 1873 to 1893, and one in 1929 to 1939. And now the one in 2008 to now. This is a slow motion collapse of the system. They're growing maybe at 2%, but probably under, up over a little bit. But they're not growing enough to absorb the proletarians who've been displaced. And they're not growing enough for the workers' to, wages to go up and to have a new capitalist prosperity the way they had after World War II and after World War I, till the crash. And that's what would be a revival of capitalism. If they were able to find some way to get economic growth of four, five, six percent, put millions of workers back to work, tens of millions of workers, at decent wages. But that's gone. It's passed. It is no longer in the cards. And we can go over why. And it's in the book. We'll, we'll just discuss it at a future time. There's nothing in the world situation that has the seeds of a big recovery for capitalism. There's nothing. 
It's stagnating. It's stagnating at low growth to crisis, contraction. And they can't get out of it. It's been how many years now since the collapse, uh, since 2009? That's when it's supposed to have started growing again, in June 2009. Where are they? They're sitting on trillions of dollars worth of cash. They can't do anything with it. If they started building trillions of dollars worth of factories, the whole thing would fall down. Who's going to buy it? They created overproduction and low-wage capitalism at the same time. How are you going to revive capitalism on the basis of low wages or unemployment? There's ju it, it, does, it can't be done. That's just the that's the long and the short of it. The workers don't know it yet. They've been put to sleep by the labor leadership here for decades and decades. But not, nothing can go in a straight line forever, including <laughs> lack of class consciousness. It can go in a straight line forever. Backwardness, and backwardness, that's a bad word. Cultural, cultural, um, Deficits, not understanding what's going on. You know, soon they're going to have to understand. They knew how to get Obamacare, by the way. They learned how to sign up for it. They don't know who gave it to them. But as one commentator says, they're going to know who took it away from them. So this can't go on forever. And we have to remember this. This is what we live for, is the general crisis of capitalism. But we wanted to have a revolutionary outcome, not a demoralizing outcome, see. And that's what can happen if there's not a genuine determined revolutionary party that knows where it's going, knows where it is now, and doesn't deceive itself, but knows exactly where it wants to go, what the future should be, and how to get there, and learns all the lessons of history, all the lessons of the class struggle, all the deceptions of the bourgeoisie, all the difficulties with the proletariat, learns all that and perseveres anyway. Perseveres based on a historical materialist understanding of history. That's what historical materialism, it's a revolutionary ideology. It points to the contradiction of socialized labor and private property, pushing on each other, pushing on each other. Workers being subjected to global race to the bottom, global competition with each other, poverty, low wages, smashing unions, like in, in Bangladesh. And all this is because everything they do is in the context and in the physical environment created by the bourgeoisie, owned by the bourgeoisie, not created, owned by the bourgeoisie. They can't break out of it. The only way to break out is to overturn the whole thing. So what historical materialism is about is trying to use the scientific method to show that revolution is inevitable. Not maybe, not a good idea, but inevitable. But it takes a revolutionary party. It took Napoleon to wipe out feudalism 
in all of Eastern Europe and part of Western Europe. If somebody had dropped a brick on his head when he was 10, that might not have happened. You needed leadership. You needed leaders. And, and that's what we aspire to be. And, and there's not, that's historical material. Anyway, what do you say, Richard? The, the capitalists, and specifically imperialists, will never stop being arrogant adventurous or cruel or greedy. So because of that, they're not going to be satisfied that the shit is not going to work the same way going forward. They're just going to always try to find a way to keep going mm -hmm. on our backs. And this will account for more wars, regardless of what they get out of the war. They, first of all, some of the wars are political. Um, everything is economic, right? But a lot of the times, the wars are to break up uh, some alliances here and there. Like, for example, uh, the, Middle East, uh, the Middle East, who want to break up the, the, the alliance between Syria and Hezbollah and Iran and so forth. So there's going to be wars. And there are going to be ways to, there are going to be lies to explain these wars. There are going to be lies to get us on board um, to, to, to um, support these wars or not object to them. That's what we have in Syria right now. Um, I just read an article today that, uh, um, what's, what's, what, what was um, what's the rebranding of um, Al Nusra Front? Uh, something Al Sham? Yes. They have not been included in the, 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 the terrorist watch list. The, you know, we have an affiliate of Al Qaeda that's fighting in Syria right now. Who have they been calling moderate rebels for a long time? They, they, they officially um, disaffiliated with ISIS a couple of years ago, but they're still affiliated with Al Qaeda. But they've changed their name and it's just been dropped from a terrorist watch list, primarily because they've been funded, or a, a, a segment of their, their group has been funded by, by Britain and the United States. So, we're, you know, if they put them back on a list with their new name, they will have to admit to, be, to funding terrorists. So they can't admit that, so we're just going to call them terrorists. But they're terrorists. So that's, that's one of the ways they're going to be funding war, for example. Um, yeah. I, it's not going to be successful. But it's going to cause some destruction. It's going to cause some capitalists are going to make money because shit will be destroyed and rebuilt. But it's not going to be on a scale that's going to revive capitalism to the glory days of capitalism. Now we're at the dead end where it's, you know, they're richer, they're richer people in the world, in the world now than we've ever had, even at this, this stage, because capitalism is an accumulative process. And there's always somebody at the top until we take it over completely. And the person at the top or the people at the top or the groups at the top or the companies at the top, they're always filthy rich, regardless of how bad shit is on the ground. That's, that's, that's my little piece. I'm sure. I wanted just to make a point about medical justice. Sorry. I wanted to make a point about medical justice. Uh, and I wanted to point out that the Hello? No, it's on. The medical industrial complex, which has reaped in huge profits for the drug companies and the medical complexes and many of the hospitals, especially the private ones, rather than the city hospitals and county hospitals. And the point being, from what I understood you said, Medicare, Medicaid is going off the board, so to speak. And I'm sure Medicare is the next thing they're looking to chop. And I think probably this money is going to be turned into the war drive of whatever they're doing to expand for capitalist profit. And health care was something that was fought and won with the Obamacare, which was not good from the point of view of poor and working people because of the way the system was set up with the insurance companies. But this looks like taking this away means they're throwing another gauntlet at poor and working people because it will make health care less available and cause closings of hospitals and other medical facilities. But it's an example, I guess, of how, they, how desperate they are for profits and for cutting back on any monies that go to the working class in general. That doesn't mean we shouldn't fight back. We should. But it's a point I'm making about the struggle within the U.S., aside from the global wars, which also continue. I mean, I think this is similar to what other people say, but here we are, capitalism at a dead end, and we don't have the revolutionary consciousness of, amongst the workers, despite their horrible conditions, which are worse by the moment 
You know, I mean, I have patients who lost their jobs in 2008 who had decent jobs and have never had a job since, despite, you know, and lost their health care and lost everything. But, but then, then what do we get in this this period is we get Trump and we get a rise of racism, a rise of fashion, anti-immigrant hysteria. You know, it's like, it seems worse than my last 30 years in the party or whatever. It seems like such a terrible time. And I, I know that is about capitalism being identity, but it's so difficult. Like, I know that what we've said over many years is sometimes in my many times of feeling frust frustrated, I remember Vince would say to me, you know, it's going to take some spark. Like, we don't know what that will be. We don't know, but it might take just some event that suddenly the workers will gain consciousness in a bigger way. But right now, for those of us who are in the struggle feel this, I feel, and I think other people too, too, like, okay, we're ready, you know, but yet this is what we're facing right now. Well, we don't want to, no, 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 First of all, uh, let me say this. The imperial, this is still an imperialist country, and the working class has a big way to fall before they get in a situation where they can't go on. That that's the truth. You go to Brazil, you know, or you go to Indonesia, you'll find or the Philippines, you'll see where there's a long way to go <coughs> in the US for the workers. They can still get Medicaid. Don't forget that. There are millions get Medicaid, 11 million, you know, so they can get, still get disability insurance. <coughs> they can get all kinds of stuff to keep them from going under. Individuals go under, but the class as a whole is still surviving by one way or another. But even if that weren't true, this is capitalist politics breeds reaction unless there's a counter action to it. The strength of the bourgeoisie is ideological. All the cops in the world and all the spy agencies in the world can't overcome the working class when it's organized, conscious, and aroused. Why are they unorganized? Why are they despondent? Because they're ideologically in the grip of the bourgeoisie that tells them you can't fight City Hall, this is the way it is. We're the rulers. You're the ruled. Stay there. You get Clinton, who tells them, everything is fine. It's great. We're going to be better. Workers know better than that. So they voted for Trump. First they voted for Sanders. When they had a choice. People went from Sanders to Trump. A lot of them. Some of them went from Obama to Trump. But they're dominated ideologically, and there's no way out of that. You can feel bad and, and stuff, but it's not going to get us anywhere. We have to build a party that can intervene, not just by activism, but ideologically and politically with the workers and find the vanguard find the advanced elements, 
build up a core, a strong core of working class revolutionaries. There's no shortcut to that. And there's no other way around it. We don't throw up our hands. That's why we study historical materialism. We're saying the technological revolution as applied by the bourgeoisie is eating away at the proletariat. And its first manifestation may be to go towards reaction. But let me tell you something. You know why they go for the right wing in Europe? Because 50 years ago, 50 years ago, 75 years ago, the European communists and socialists who dominated European politics had the largest parties gave up the revolution and said, we surrender. We're going to try to restore bourgeois democracy. And that's our program. And this is what they got. They abandoned Leninism. They abandoned their heritage as communists and decided they were going to be good Democrats and defend capitalist democracy against fascism. That became the line of the socialist and communist movement in Europe and, of course, in the United States. And what did they get? Le Pen. The old Deutschland in Germany. The Golden Dawn. The Hungarian right wing. That's what they got. They gave up their revolutionary heritage. And they led the workers down the garden path of fighting for bourgeois democracy as the ultimate goal. Stop fascism. Stop the right. There's a particular political tendency that we think really highly of in general. But they voted for Gore. They voted for uh, Kerry on the grounds of Stop the right. So what did we get for that? Trump. If we don't build a party that's going to stand up to this garbage, that's going to fight social democracy, reformism, and phony bourgeois Democrats, <laughs> politically and ideologically, among the workers, with our agitation and propaganda to reach as many as we can, then we will have failed in our responsibility. That's the truth. That's the big thing. It's the ideological stranglehold of bourgeois ideology in one form or another. Social democracy, that's bourgeois ideology. Democratize capitalism. Democratize it. Nationalize some industries. But let the capitalists stay. That ideology in Europe has to be destroyed by the communist workers. And it has to be done here most of all. Because frankly, <laughs> a great revolutionary once said, this is the country where the fate of humanity is going to be forged, the United States. And if you believe that, and there's no reason not to, this is the world's most powerful country. It's got the most numerous working class, save for China. And it's here where the struggle has to be joined, over here. It's a long way. But as long as we know the way, as long as we know not just the way, but how to get there, how to take one step at a time. See, take Sanders. Sanders decided at his old age he's going to challenge the Democratic Party. He's been there for 100 years. Been called a socialist. 
He could see the handwriting on the wall. He could see the misery in the country. He could see the bankruptcy of the Democrats. He decided to make a challenge. They chopped him to pieces. He could have won, hands down. Hands down. But he capitulated. That's what goes on in bourgeois politics. Capitulation to the Social Democrats and capitulation to the reformists and those who want to keep capitalism going and retain capitalist property relations. If there was a semi-revolution tomorrow, Sanders and all his people and maybe not Clinton, but people to the left of Clinton, what's her name, the woman from Massachusetts, Warren. Warren. They'd be in the streets, yay, B bring the revolution on. They would, and workers would fall for it, unless we're there to explain the role of social democrats. And don't kid yourself, this is, in the, this is on the agenda. Not tomorrow, but it will be. Where did Elizabeth Warren runs in 2020? And everybody swoons. The party has to be able to fight this ideologically. We needed to go into the Sanders movement, to be honest with you, and, pull, and find out who's who and what's what, and what are they thinking, and pull out the best ones, and show, because we knew he was going to be trite, he wasn't going to break. That's not US politics. We don't break. Jesse Jackson tried it once. He did a great job, actually, and we supported him in that attempt. But in the end, he had to shake hands with Gore and come back into the fold. Because that's not what US politics is. In Europe, you can have different proportional representation. You can have how many seats in the House, in, in the Assembly, and blah, 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 blah. So it's easier to stand up and be separated like Macron did in France. But over here, we knew he was going to give in. He, 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 he couldn't. He's, he's 70 whatever, he's got a nice senatorial salary, he, he, he's got the Senate, he's in the Millionaires Club, he's not a millionaire, but it's, it's, that's where he is. So we needed to be able to explain this, explain this to the workers, Ex explain to the proletariat, look, Sanders is a good guy, we like a lot of the things he's saying. Uh, but but don't go with him because he's going to be for the same old shell game that the capitalist system is. And he's going to support it. If we didn't know that he supported nasty things in, in Syria and in Korea, we didn't have to know that. We have to know only the nature of bourgeois politics in the United States. But not too many people will sing that song. We have to tell the workers the plain truth in a way that they can understand it without being obscure, without being separating ourselves from them, without seeming superior, without seeming, you know, uh, just unnecessarily polemical. The art of P political persuasion is, is an art which we have to master. But anyway, I, I'll get off. It, it, there's no other way around it. If you want to take the weapons away from the enemy, know what his weapons are. It's not the cops alone. It's not the Homeland Security alone. It's the ideology the stranglehold that they have on the people. And we've got to break that. And we build a party on the basis of that. Otherwise, we don't do what we're supposed to do. That's it.